do that. And while you do that, let me tell you, I have a theory about high visibility vests. Here's my theory. If you want to walk in anywhere unhindered and do whatever you want without anyone batting an eyelid or questioning why you're there, then a high-vis vest is all you need. Put one of those babies on, and if you really want to go the whole hog, um, a hard hat and a clipboard will, will finish off the look. And I reckon if you have those things, you can go anywhere you want and do whatever you want without anyone questioning you. People will see what you are clothed in, and they will assume that you are someone important doing something important. Clothing matches identity. See a high-vis vest and assume, I don't know, a surveyor or something. Clothing fits identity. And as we, we carry on our series in Colossians tonight, and by the way, big thanks to Paul for preaching uh, last week in this series. Uh, Paul, n- not that one, but the Apostle Paul, has something to say about clothing. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Now, he's not talking literally, of course, about clothes, but about behavior, about clothing ourselves in certain types of action. See how he goes on. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and so on. And so the the big question in this passage is, how, as a Christian, can I live a godly life? How, as a Christian, can I live a godly life? We have so many good intentions, don't we, about the way we like to live. And if you are a Christian here today, then like me, in your heart of hearts, you will want to live to please God. But like me, so often I'm sure you find that that you fail. And so what's the answer? It's an important question, isn't it? We want to live a godly life. How can a Christian live a godly life? And the answer Paul will give is the high-vis vest answer. It's the identity answer. In the same way that an identity gives rise to certain types of clothing, so being certain about our identity in Christ will lead to certain types of behavior. So the answer to the question, how can I live a godly life, is all about identity. You've actually got to start not with what you do, but with who you are. And if you're here for the first time tonight, or you're watching online, you're, maybe you're not a Christian, you're just looking into these things. Even if that's not you, I hope that what we discover tonight will actually radically shake up how we think about the Christian faith. More of that later. For now, I want you to know that that, that the big question of this passage is that one. How do I live a godly life? We are in the middle of Colossians, as I said, which is, of course, a book in the New Testament. I say a book, it's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul, who is a key leader in the early church, to a particular church in the ancient city of Colossae. Now, you'll remember that that the church in Colossae is relatively small, relatively young, it hasn't existed for very long, perhaps just a few years, but it is a good church, it's a growing church, but it's also a church under pressure, it's facing certain difficulties. There were some in and around this Colossian church that who were teaching that that faith in Jesus was good, but not sufficient. According to them, trusting in Christ was a good start, but if you wanted to be really spiritual, well, you'd have to add some other things on as well. Certain human rules must be kept, or certain traditions or religious practices, or certain spiritual experiences had to be gained if you wanted to be really spiritual. 
That's what they were teaching. And a lot of these false teachers, they talked a good game. They they sounded impressive as they taught this stuff. For example, look at chapter 2, verse 18. Paul says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. So these people, the false teachers, they claimed to have worshipped angels, perhaps seen great spiritual visions. And you can understand why Christian people were impressed by that or attracted to that, can't you? Because what real Christian doesn't want a, a fuller experience of God? And if we want fuller experiences of God, we, we also want fuller experiences of the Christian life. We, we want to live in obedience to Christ. And, well, the false teachers had an answer for that as well. They had created a system of rules to govern their living. Look at chapter 2, verse 21. Do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch. Now, these rules were supposed to help you to live a godly, obedient life. And on the face of it, they they seem pretty good. Verse 23, such regulations, says Paul, indeed have an appearance of wisdom. With their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body. But here's the blow. They don't work. Paul goes on. They lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Some people are all talk, aren't they? Um, I'm not a big golf fan, but I I once read that former President Bill Clinton uh, is famous on the golf course. I guess because he's the president, he can call up anyone he wants and have a game of golf with them. And um, many are surprised that, that Clinton could keep up with these pros on the golf course Apparently, he talks a good game. Back in the clubhouse, he'll boast of his impressive score. Uh, But it's all talk. Apparently, Clinton awards himself presidential mulligans, uh, free shots to boost his score. A friend of the president said, he talks a good game, but it's not the real score. And it's a bit like that with these false teachers. They, They talk a good game, but it's not the real score. They they talk a good game, but in the end, it's all talk. They have a lot of rules, but the rules don't really work. They tap into this real desire that we do have to to get rid of our sinful behavior and to put on holy living. Take a look at the list of sin, chapter 3, verse 5. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed. And then more in verse 8, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Who doesn't want to get rid of these things? I wish I was more rid of them than I am. And by contrast, who doesn't, verse 12, want to clothe themselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience? That is what we want, isn't it? And so the false teachers offered these man-made rules. They talked a good game. But if you've tried to fight your sin in the real world, you will know as well as I do that, that rules, although they can sometimes be helpful, aren't the real solution. Rules alone don't work. We might fight our lust by having accountability software on our computer, which is a good thing to do, and I do. We might fight our greed by having rules about our spending patterns. We might try and manage our anger by waiting 24 hours before replying to our emails. We might try and suppress slander by having rules about who we speak to and when. And look, some of these things are are wise advice. They're not all bad. But here's the problem. Rules alone don't change our hearts. They might hem in our desires here and there, but, but they don't change our desires fundamentally. 
our hearts still want to come out with the slander and the lust and the greed and whatever else. Such regulations, says Paul, have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, false humility, harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in really restraining sensual indulgence. Do you see? So here's the thing. How do we deal with all these things, all these behaviors that don't belong in the Christian life? How can we live a life worthy of the Lord? Well, that is what chapter 3 is all about, and we're about to get there. But first, I promise we are getting to the answer, but first, just remember that this is what Paul has been praying for the Colossian Christians all along. Just flip back for a moment to chapter 1, verse 10. Paul is praying that they may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. That's a great prayer, isn't it? That's a prayer for, for this living the Christian life as we should. But again, we want to push further and ask, well, how? What's the process? Well, chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. How do we live as we should? How can we live an obedient life? Well, not through particular visions, not through worshipping angels, but, look at the words of verse 9, through knowledge, through wisdom, through understanding. Those are the things that transform our living. When we know, more and more, when we know the truth about God, we've got to fill our tank, fill our minds with the truth of God. That's the start of the answer to living an obedient life for Christ. And so, no surprise, in chapter 3, that's what Paul does. He starts to fill their minds, fill their tanks with the knowledge of God, and particularly with the knowledge about Jesus. Because if you haven't got it yet, in Colossians, the point is Jesus is everything. If you have Jesus, you don't need anything else to be saved and made a child of God. If you have Jesus, you don't need any particular further spiritual experience. In Christ and through the working of his Holy Spirit, you have everything you need to live a godly and obedient life. And so, back in chapter 3 now, when he's addressing this question of how do we live for Jesus, notice what Paul doesn't do. He doesn't give us a chapter's worth of rules. That's what the false teachers are doing. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, don't do that. No, no, Paul does none of that. Instead, he just talks and talks or writes and writes and writes about Jesus. So chapter 2, verse 20, have a look. Paul writes about Christ's death. Since you died with Christ, he writes about the death of Christ. Or chapter 3, verse 1, Paul writes about Christ's resurrection. Since you have been raised with Christ. And then look at the second half of that verse. It's, it's all about the ascension of Jesus and what we call the, the heavenly session, his reign. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then in chapter 3, verse 4, Paul speaks about Christ's return, his second coming. When Christ appears, do you see? If you've lost the plot or fallen asleep, now's the time to wake up. This is the key point. Paul wants to help us live a godly life if we are Christians. He doesn't give us a list of man-made rules. He just talks and talks about Jesus. He writes about the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the heavenly session, the return of Christ. From chapter 2, verse 20 to chapter 3, verse 
for. And then Paul says, if you're going to live a godly life, you need to know how being in Christ ties you to all of these momentous events. If you're a Christian, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the heavenly session, the return of Christ, you have been bound up with all of this. Strange as it might seem, if you're a Christian, Paul says that you are in fact tied in, linked into these great historic events, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the return of Jesus. Do you see again, chapter 2, verse 20, since you died with Christ. Since you, chapter 3, verse 1, have been raised with Christ. Chapter 3, verse 3, your life is now hidden with Christ. Do you see? If you are a Christian, he says you are in Christ. You are now so closely bound up with him that in a sense you have had all of these experiences as well. You have died to your old self. You have been raised with Christ. You have been seated with him as Paul says elsewhere, in the heavenly realms. And when Christ returns, in a sense, you too will return. You will be revealed to be the child of God that you are. Do you see? He doesn't give rules. He just talks and talks about Jesus and about the identity that you have if you're in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Little old you, little old me insignificant as we are if you are a Christian you have a share in these great momentous events now just think how amazing that would have been for these Colossian Christians to hear the false teachers were knocking around talking about their visions of angels and maybe their spiritual experiences and they were probably claiming a kind of spiritual authority and kind of insinuating that these normal Colossian Christians were kind of lacking something, like a sort of second-grade tier of believers. But Paul says to these believers, who felt very ordinary, no, no, you've you've reached the heights already. You're not just in angels, no, no, you're in Christ. He's saying, Christian, do you see what and who you are in Christ? Christ. What an amazing position you have. What an incredible identity you have. None of it deserved, of course. All of it given as as a free gift. Won by Christ for you at the cross. And then he says, okay, now do you see? Now do you see how that knowledge of your position, who you are, well, that will change how you live. Again, he doesn't give a list of rules. He says, look at who you are, because how you behave all flows out of who you are. How you live all flows out of your identity. Chapter 2, verse 20, since you died with Christ, so then, chapter 3, verse 5, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You see, since you died with Christ, put all these behaviors to death. So let me ask, what are you struggling with at the moment? What sin do you feel you just can't overcome? May well be one of those things listed in verses 5 to 9. It could be something else. Well, look, think of that sin. And remember, sin provokes God's anger and judgment, rightly so. But then remember, Jesus has died to deal with the wrath of God. And you have died with Christ. And so remember your new position. And say to yourself, since I have died to sin, so I will put to death that sin. Now, you won't do it perfectly. Until Christ does return and and all is revealed and we are changed, there will still be lingering sin in our lives. Nonetheless, we should expect to change bit by bit. 
as we see more and more who we are, our status, our identity as those in Christ, since you died with Christ, what place does all this stuff have in your life anymore? Since you died with him, put it to death. And then there's the resurrection and ascension, chapter 3, verse 1. Since you've been raised with Christ, well then, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And instead, set your mind, your eyes, your heart on things above. In our house, Morag does the DIY and um, I think one of the reasons for that is mindset. I'm the sort of negative, miserable person who, when, when, when I encounter a, a technological problem, I'm okay with computers, but anything beyond that washing machine, no chance. I look at this washing machine and all of its moving parts and think, there is no way I'm going to be able to fix it. Whereas Morag seems to approach things with, well, why on earth should I not be able to fix it? I'm an intelligent person. She seems to be able to do anything she can set her mind on. What you set your mind on makes a difference to what you do. Paul is saying, Christians, set your mind on Jesus. Again and again. Set your mind, fill your mind and your heart with the fact that Christ has died for you. And so with him you have died. And so set your mind on, on putting to death the sin that has no place in your life anymore. Christian, since you've been raised with Christ, set your minds on God things, on godly things, on heavenly things. So let me ask you, Christian, what do you set your mind on? It's kind of a grand way to ask the question, isn't it? I, think, I don't know. What do I set my mind on? Well, let me put it this way. What do you daydream about in those Idle moments when you, your mind wanders. Is it, I wish I had a bit more cash, then I could do this or that or the other? It's a danger that Christians set our minds on, on earthly things, that our mindset ends up being virtually indistingu indistinguishable from the mindset of, of an unbeliever. And when we do that, you, you see it in our lives. You see it in the way we use our time or, or the things we prioritize. I love this quote from the American pastor, John Piper. It's from a very, very famous sermon called Don't Waste Your Life. It's all about what you set your mind on and how that plays out. Let me quote it. He says this. He says, I will tell you what a tragedy is. I will show you how to waste your life. Consider a story from the February 1998 edition of the Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who, quote, took early retirement from their jobs in the Northwest five years ago. He was 59, she was 51. They now live in Punta, Punta Georgia, Florida, where they cruise on a 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life. And let the last great work of your life before you give an account to your creator be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ at the great day of judgment. Look, Lord, see my shells. That is a tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. But over and against it, I put my protest. Don't buy it. Don't waste your life, says John Piper. So Christian, you have been raised with Christ. You no longer live and you no longer need to live a kind of meaningless existence. We have a great purpose in the gospel. Don't waste your life chasing after worthless trinkets. I have a friend, uh, 
Joe, who I used to work with at a church back in Newcastle, not so long ago, he, he and his wife and four kids left a comfortable, affluent life in the UK to head to Mozambique to share the gospel. What motivates someone to do that? Well, Joe and his family set their minds and their hearts on, on God things, on things above. And that spilled over into godly living. You don't have to go to Mozambique to live a godly life, but you see the point. If your mind is set on the things of this life, you will live a life that merges in with the world around us. But if your mind and heart are set on things above, on God things, on gospel things, then you will live a life that goes after God things and gospel things. So, what about us? What about us? What are we setting our minds on? Are we seeing the, the relationships around us as God-given gospel opportunities? This is why reading God's word every day is so important. It's about setting our minds in the right direction. It's why being at church is so crucial. How many hours a week do we spend being bombarded by the messages of the world around us? From the TV producers and the advertising agencies. We are bombarded with a thousand other messages. Be here at church. Hear different news. Set your mind in a different place. We need the encouragement of that. Fix our eyes on things above. It's why small group Bible study is so important. Again, the world around us wants us to... Meet up with people to chat about all kinds of things, but never the word of God. We've got to do that if we're going to fix our minds on things above. Do you see? It's not, in the end, not more rules that I need. It's not more rules. It's more certainty about my status, my identity in Christ. That's what will spill over into changed living not more rules and regulations it's knowing the truth not only about who Christ is but who I am in Christ if I belong to them it's like when you have that slightly sickening experience of meeting someone who's recently fallen head over heels in love and he just wants to be with her all the time and when he's not with her he all he wants to do is talk about her all the time even if you don't want to hear and all he does is looking forward to the next time he gets to be with her He has his mind set on her. Look at those fantastic words there in verse 4. Five words in verse 4. Christ who is your life. Christ is our life. He's our everything. And when we see how true that is, then, then, it will begin to spill over into living a life worthy of Christ, longing to please him in every way. When Christ is your life, you don't need more human regulations and you won't be all talk. You won't just speak a good game, you'll begin to live a good game because you long to please him, because Christ is your everything. You'll think about him, long to know him, and to know him better. And as Paul says wonderfully there in verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, so also on that great and glorious day when he returns, you too will appear with him forever in glory. What a wonderful thought. One day, Christ who is our life, we will be with him for all eternity. Let's pray together. Let's have a moment of quiet reflection. What has God been especially impressing upon you from his word tonight?
Father, forgive us when our minds have been fixed anywhere but you. Father, we pray that you might help us to experience true joy and satisfaction in setting our minds and thoughts and hearts and lives on Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us more of a longing for Christ, that you would help us to see that he is indeed our life. And then, Lord, we pray not out of some dry sense of duty or some mere obedience to rules, but out of a deep conviction of who we are, Lord, that that would spill over into changed living that puts off sin and in the power of your spirit, we clothe ourselves with all righteousness and goodness and kindness and patience. Lord, we ask for your help in all of this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this last hymn talks about following Jesus. It's a reminder that Jesus walked uh, the dark path of Calvary's cross and that following him for us may also mean hardship and difficulty. But it says, verse 2, I will follow him, the one who would the humble servant be, and know in serving him it is that I am truly free. Uh, If you don't know the words, you will at least know the tune. So let's stand and sing together. i uh-huh.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please do sit. And as always, stay for a coffee. Uh, refreshments at the back.